please join us in giving special thanks to our family of patrons. Story folk Paul Jackson, Christy Carson, Sean Powell, Shawnee Basket, and Selena Vokenhauer. Thanks to their support, the stories keep flowing. You're listening to Lore and Legend, tales from our mythic past. Hello and welcome. I'm Rick Scott, bringing you legendary tales inspired by the rich traditions of world folklore and mythology. If you're enjoying the episode today, please consider joining Christy, Paul, Sean, Shawnee and Selena as patrons and help us pay for the music, the audio effects, the art and the technology that we use to enhance our telling of these wonderful stories. If you go to our website at www loreandlegend.co.uk and click support us, then you can find out how. Today we're talking to storyteller Tamar Williams. Tamar is a bilingual storyteller, telling stories in Welsh and English. She grew up hearing the myths and legends told of in the Mabinogion, but only much later was she introduced to the world of storytelling as a contemporary performance art form. In 2013, she won the National Storyteller of the Year competition, launching her into a career as a storyteller, doing gigs and running workshops throughout the UK and as far afield as Belgium, Switzerland, China and Laos. Tamar has built a career developing storytelling projects in Wales with a wide variety of artists, community groups, festivals and arts organisations, and currently she organises Bristol's bi-monthly story night, Story Pub, and is an engagement coordinator for the Beyond the Border International Storytelling Festival. Our conversation explored Tamar's own journey from theatre and acting into the world of professional storytelling, how the stories she tells have changed and evolved, and her emerging sense of purpose as a storyteller. We also talk about how her work confronts the representation of women in myth and folk stories, and how storytellers can address the problems that are thrown up for modern tellers and audiences in our uses of traditional material. And so, we begin now with Tamar's story. The farm at Nantes Caravan lay in a green valley and on one side of the valley was the hill stretching up and on the other side of that hill was the town of Llanbryn Meyer. and along the edge of the farmyard at the farm at Nant Caravan was the Nant Caravan river that went running down through the hills towards the ocean far far away and in Nant Caravan farm there lived Caris and her husband, John, and her son, Kedri. And Kedri had only just been born. He was a beautiful baby boy with a head of black curls, just like his father, John. And now Karis, she was known roundabout as Karis Nant Carvan because of where she lived. And she was also known as a lucky girl. People would say, Karis, she's had a charmed life. She's married a good man, John at Nant Caravan, he's going to give her a good life. And she's just had a son. What more can a woman want? But then, one day, something happened. Something that would mean people would never again refer to her as lucky. One night, when John, Caris's husband, was coming back late from the fields, he slipped and fell into the Nant Caravan River. And he was swept away and he was drowned. And just as Caris was learning to grieve the loss of her husband, the farm was raided by the Gwylliaid Cochion, the red-headed brigands of mid Wales. And they took absolutely everything. They took all of her livestock. They took, they even ripped the crops out of her fields, leaving her and her son Kedri with absolutely nothing to face the winter ahead. Now, this in fact was just before midsummer, but It didn't matter that the sun was shining. It didn't matter that the days were very long and that the warmth was in the air. Caris was still sitting there in the knowledge that she had nothing, nothing to keep her son safe, nothing to keep herself safe and a cold, hard winter 
amidst the mountains of Mid Wales ahead of her. And so three days before midsummer, Caddis was sat in her kitchen and Kedri was playing in a basket beside her, beside the fire. And she had her head in her hands and she couldn't even cry. She had this pain sitting in her chest, but she couldn't let it out because she knew if she did, she wouldn't stop crying. And all she could think, all that was going round and round in her head was, what do I do? How do I keep him safe? How do I keep myself safe? How do I get money? And as she sat there thinking this, there came three knocks at the front door. Well, Caddis went to the front door, she opened it and standing outside the door was the most beautiful woman she'd ever seen in her life before. This woman, her face shone like the sun. She had long golden hair. She was wearing a long green dress that touched the ground and she was smiling at Caddis with a face that was soft, a face that was kind. And she said, Caddis, bring Hariad. And Caddis did not know how this woman knew her name, but seeing this woman, she instantly melted. And the woman held out her hand to Caddis and in her hand, was a great big pile of golden coins, more money than Caddis had ever seen in her entire life. And the woman said to Caddis, Beth Basati Nait, what would you do to have this money, to have these coins? Well, Caddis opened her mouth and the word spilled out, Indru Beth, anything. What would you give me? said the woman, to have these coins. And the word again spilled out of Caddis's mouth, Indrubith, anything. The woman's face went from being soft to hard in a second. Her eyes went from Caddis to Kedri, the baby, playing in his basket. She said, Os Indrubith, if anything, I will take your child. I didn't mean him, said Caddis. I didn't mean him, but it was too late. The woman was staring at the baby. Her arm was reaching out towards him. She said, you said anything. You gave me your word. But don't worry. I can't take him now. Our laws state that I must wait three days to take your child. After three days on Midsummer's Day, I shall return. And if you cannot tell me my true name, then I shall take him. But don't worry, I shall leave you with a changeling child in his place and the changeling will stay with you. But as the season turns and the days grow short and cold, he will start to fade until this winter you will be left alone. And then the woman turned on her heel and she strode off across the farmyard, crossing over the river, until the green of her dress disappeared into the green of the woods around the farm. Caddis had no idea what to do. She went back into the kitchen. She sat down at the kitchen table. She put her head in her hands and she howled. She cried. She let all that pain that had been stuck in her chest, she let it all come pouring out. She cried and she cried and she cried and she went to the basket and she grabbed Kedri in her arms and she held him tight and she cried and she cried and she cried. And then when she was done crying, she dried her eyes. She strapped Kedri to her back and she strode out of the farmhouse. And she squared her shoulders and she walked over the hill from the farm at Nant Caravan to the village of Llanbrin Mayer. And at the end of the village of Llanbrin Mayer, there was a little house with smoke curling out of the chimney. A tiny house, a little dilapidated with flowers in the front garden. And Caris strode up to that little house and she knocked on the door. And the door was opened by the wise woman of the village whose name was Mary Megan. Now everybody thought Mary Megan was a witch. But Caris knew that if anybody could help her, it would be Mary Megan. Because you see, Caris was not a fool. She had been listening. She'd been listening to that woman in the green dress and the woman had said, our laws, meaning not the laws of this land, but the laws of the other world, the laws of the world of the Tolwith Tig, the fairy folk. And she knew, Caddis knew that Mary Megan knew everything there was to know about the Tolwith Tig, the fairy folk. So the door was opened by the wise woman and the wise woman saw Caddis and she said, come in, Deramon. 
So in Caddis went, she opened her mouth and the story spilled out and Marie Megan listened to every single word she had to say. And then she was quiet for a long time. And finally, Caddis could bear it no more. She said, what can I do? How can I keep my baby? How can I stop this woman from taking him? Casgla di vriallu, said Mary Megan. A pan mar lleiad yn eichel yn yr awyr, cer di fewn i'r goedwig ac ydych chi am gylchoedd y tywydd teg. Collect primroses. And when the moon is high in the sky, go into the woods and look for fairy rings. And then you will get your answer. Thank you, said Mary Megan. She strapped Kedri onto her back again and she strode out. But by now, despite the days being so very long, night was falling and the moon was already climbing into the sky. And Caddis, she spent the whole night looking for primroses, looking along the hedgerows, looking into the deep ditches. And finally, she found herself a patch and she held them tight in her hand and she went into the woods but she didn't know what she was looking for. She'd never seen a fairy ring before. And though she walked and she walked until she was exhausted, all too soon, the short night was over, the sun was rising, and she had two days left, two days to save her son. She went back to the farm at Nant Carvan, and she did not sleep for the whole of that long day. She just watched Kedri in his basket as he dreamed she watched him, she watched as his eyes moved below his eyelids. She watched as his hair, so like his father's, shone in the light of the sun coming through the kitchen window. She drank in the sight of him, knowing that this might be one of the last days she could see him. She waited and she waited for the sun to go down. And finally, when the sun did go down, she strapped him onto her back again. She took those primroses tight in her hand and she went deep into the woods that surrounded the farm. And she walked and she walked and she walked and she looked. She looked as hard as she could for fairy rings. But what was a fairy ring? She held the primroses in her hand until they were crushed beneath her fingers. She walked until there was exhaustion in the very bones of her. Until Kedri was complaining on her back. But all too soon that short night was over. All too soon the sun was rising. And all too soon Caddis knew she had one day. One day left to find this woman's true name. One day left to save her son. She went back to the farm at Nant Caravan. The rest of that day, she did not sleep. She held Kedri, even though he protested, even though he liked sleeping on his own now, she held him in her arms. She held him so tight, she could feel his heart beat against hers. When the sun finally went down, she put him on her back and she walked deeper into the forest than she'd ever gone before. She held those primroses tight in her hand. She looked and she looked and she looked and she lost track of time completely. The moon was high above her. It was filtering through the trees. But it seemed to Caddis there was another light far ahead of her. Through the trees, she could see another light that was shining. And she walked towards that light. She walked towards that light, hardly daring to believe until she saw it there. In a clearing, among the dark trees, she saw a silver circle, a fairy ring, kilch a with tig. And in that fairy ring, there was something dancing, something small, something green, something long-fingered, something spindly limbed, something that was hopping and skipping, something that was singing. Dwi'n cael gymaint o hwyr esbri, dy fala hi fyth fe enwi, fe enwi, fe enwi, fe enwi yw, sili I am going to win this game. The widow will never guess my name. Guess my name. Guess my name. Guess my name is Silly Godot. Caddis <sighs> felt her heart for the first time since her husband's death felt light. She felt warm from the inside out. She went home and she slept for the rest of that night. And she slept actually well into the next day. The best sleep she'd ever had, in fact. And it was so late when she finally got up that it was just past midday and she was making breakfast for herself and Kedri in the kitchen of the farmhouse when there came a knock on the front door, three knocks, to be precise. Caddis opened the door and there, outside, was standing the woman in the green dress. And her face was soft once more and she was smiling. She said, Cariad, your time is up. 
I've brought you the golden coin, so we must make our exchange. But first, why don't you try to tell me my true name? Well, Caddis, she did not want to reveal too much. She said to the woman, well, how many guesses do I get of your true name? As many as you wish to have, said the woman. Well, if as many as I wish to have, said Caddis, then let me get started. Is your name Alice? Is it Bethan? Is it Shoned? Is it Enid? And with every name that Caddis said, the woman's face got harder and harder and her eyes flicked to the basket where Kedri was playing and her arm was reaching out towards him. There was longing in her eyes. There was longing in her face. Her eyes almost shone the way that Caddis knew her own eyes shone when she looked at her son. She said, one more, in my theta, just one more guess. Oh, well, if I just have one more guess, said Caddis, if just once more, then I don't suppose your name could be Silly Goddard. Well, the woman, she didn't scream, she didn't cry, but horror flooded her face. She looked to Caddis, she said, he was mine, he was going to be mine. And then suddenly she disappeared. And suddenly she was not there anymore. And where the woman had been, there was just a pile of green silk, her dress. And running across the farmyard over the Nant Caravan River was a green fingered, spindly-limbed, long-legged thing, the thing that Caddis had seen dancing in the forest the night before. Well, Caddis went to the dress, she picked it up, and out of it came falling more gold than she'd ever seen in her life before. She took it back to the kitchen table, and she and Kedri counted it together, and there was enough to see them through not one, not two, but three whole winters, and enough for Mary Megan in Llanbrin Meyer to have some too. And do you know what? From then onwards, the farm at Nant Caravan flourished and Kedri grew and they managed to rebuild themselves. And soon it became a place of love and luck once more between the green hills by the edge of the Nant Caravan River, just over the hill from Llanbrin Meyer. Thank you. I hope that sounded all right. It was, it was brilliant. I'm so glad that you sang as well. It's <laughs> always a high point of your performance. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's great. And it's, uh, uh, I think it might, you know, illustrate some of the things that you've been talking about. Mm. Um, so, I mean, everybody will rep- recognize the basic st- um, structure of frame mm. when postal skin. But, uh, you know, that um, the specific thing, the characters, the image of the woman and her child, Mm. um, the framing of it as a a tale about loss and rebuilding, you know, that's um, that's how the, you know, the, 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 the tale... It's like a prism that you move in a different direction and it suddenly becomes something different. It's a weird story as well because I, you know, it is, it's basically a Rumpelstiltskin story, but it, I haven't done any adaptation on it actually. Um, it exists within that form. I found it in a, an ancient book of Welsh folk tales. Nobody else I know tells the story. Um, it literally was one of those books that was like at the back of the library, like missing its cover, you know? Um, but it's also incredibly landscape specific, like Llanbrin Maid is a place, it's right in the centre of Wales, it's basically as you drive over into Snowdonia, if you're coming from South Wales to North Wales, it's kind of bang at the path where the kind of mountains of Snowdonia begin. Um, so, you know, again, as with so many Welsh stories, very landscape specific, the places exist, um, there's these kind of historical details with the the red-headed brigands of mid Wales, the Gwylliad Cochion, they were real people. Um, but then also, the, like you say, the form is the, the story of Rumpelstiltskin. Um, so I don't know where it comes from. And I, I love that it's so specific. And really that her being a widow, her having her son and her wanting to try and protect him w- was all there. It was one of those stories that I came to and I just loved it straight away because 
I think the image of the mother as well, I don't have many stories about women who have children before the story begins, you know, stories tend to be about women who are trying to have children or um, want to try and get rid of their children because they're stepmothers, you know. Um, whereas this was, this felt like something really different. I don't know. The image of a woman with a baby on her back, like trying to save him, is quite powerful. I was going to pick that up precisely, you know, as somebody who visualizes an, as an artist as well, you know, that's. Yeah. Oh, the the character of this story is like the hero is a woman with a child on her back. I thought, oh, that's yeah. that's cool. I haven't I haven't really seen that before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes you feel like you can do or anything. Not, not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mm. so that's a, it's a really great find. Mm. Yeah. So hello, uh, my name's Tamar Elinette Williams and I am a storyteller based in Cardiff in Wales. Um, I've been working as a storyteller professionally for about six years now um, and most of my, my work is very varied. Um, it's in normal times, it's um, a lot of work in schools. Um, I also collaborate with um organizations and festivals to create performance work for families um, and for adult audiences for lots of different audiences really most of my repertoire is Welsh mythology um, and I work um, bilingually in Welsh and English which um, has meant that I've been able to work pretty consistently really ever since I went freelance about five years ago um, and I, I mean I'm really drawn to the stories um of the landscape in Wales. Um, I grew up in Wales. I grew up speaking Welsh and English. I grew up hearing the mythology of Wales, mostly the Mabinogi stories. And when I moved out of Wales is actually when I started storytelling when I was living in Birmingham. And um, I think it came from a place of nostalgia, really, a place of um, what we call hiraith, a missing, missing home. Um, I started to tell stories about Wales because I wasn't in Wales at the time. And then when I moved back to Wales, um, I found that I wanted to continue um, and I started to get gigs as a storyteller um, and I just love it. I love I love being able to tell the stories that I remember being told when I was younger and I love telling them to lots of different people, lots of different age groups, children, young people, adults and, and that magic moment when you say, I'm going to tell you a story and people sometimes are initially a bit sceptical and then then they sit and they listen to a story and they're completely transformed by the experience. <laughs> yeah, so we, we first met in Birmingham, didn't we? Um, we did. Through uh, sort of uh, uh, Graham Langley and the traditional arts team and that kind yeah. of thing. You said you started to tell these tales in Birmingham. Were you aware of storytelling as kind of like a tradition or an art in the contemporary world before then or was that a bit of a revelation or? it was really I mean it was really interesting because I feel like I had been around storytelling all my life like I said I was told stories when I was in school I was told the stories of Mabinogi but I also used to go to festivals folk festivals and things like that where people would be telling stories and I I think I heard Taffy Thomas for example tell when I was very small and then had that experience when I heard him tell as an adult where it was like stepping back in time, hearing his voice was like returning to a child self, really. Um, but I had never thought of it as a job. I'd never thought of it as a potential job for me. And I don't think I'd been aware of how developed it was as an art form, um, as a contemporary art form. I didn't realise there was a storytelling scene. Um, I was studying theatre at uni at the time and I met somebody called Polly Tisdall who um, I now continue to work with. Um, she won the Young Storyteller of the Year Award, um, which Graham Langley was very involved in. Um, and I saw that she was working semi-professionally at the time as a storyteller and I was just a bit intrigued. I was like, oh, I didn't realise that someone who was basically my age could be working as a storyteller. Okay, tell me more. Um, and around the same time, I competed for Young Storyteller of the Year as well. That was in 2013. Um, and the traditional arts team in Birmingham were very involved at that point where they, they ran the event. Um, <laughs> and honestly, I competed as a sort of 
I just think this would be a useful string to my bow as an, at the time I wanted to be an actor and I thought it'd be useful to have an extra skill in storytelling and maybe, you know, have done a bit of that work. Um, but then I won and ended up from winning the competition kind of completely unexpectedly getting a load of gigs, being asked to perform at festivals and getting a lot of support from people like Graham um, and also Fiona Collins, who is a storyteller based in North Wales. And just this kind of outpouring of support, I suppose, from the storytelling community who really wanted to support me as a new emerging voice in storytelling, as a quote unquote young storyteller, because, um, you know, there just aren't that many young people doing storytelling. Um, and I sort of stepped into this world without really knowing what it was, but felt completely drawn to it. And probably for the first couple of years, didn't really consider doing it as a profession, didn't really consider working full time as a storyteller, but increasingly saw an opportunity for myself within that and also felt hugely drawn to it and felt like it fit me because, you know, I had trained in theatre, I trained as a performer. I was also interested in directing, I was interested in writing and storytelling fulfilled all of those things. It enabled me to perform, it enabled me to create my own work, it enabled me to adapt, it enabled me to self-direct. And I felt like I was feeling, it was. It felt like there was nothing else I could be doing. Um, but yeah, I think I went off on a ramble there, but that's basically how I sort of got into it. And I was amazed that there was such a scene yeah, I was talking to Amy Douglas recently about the importance of mentorship. Um, and it sounds like mentorship was hugely important for you. Yeah, it was. Possibly you and Amy have had a similar conversation to conversations that I've had with Amy as well, which is sort of about the, um, the, the difference between sort of informal and formal mentorship within the storytelling world and how, you know, definitely young storyteller of the year put me in contact with people who really supported my development and offered me loads of opportunities and were like giving me chances to get up and tell all the time which is exactly what you need early on as a storyteller um and I don't think I would have got that without the competition having given me that framework and given me those those contacts and I really don't think I'd be working as a storyteller today without that and also without the kind of it does give you a certain badge of respect I suppose within the storytelling world to be able to say I was young storyteller of the year um because people instantly are like oh okay well you know let's offer her a floor spot or whatever and then they see what you're like and then maybe they offer you a slightly longer floor spot and then maybe they offer you the chance to do a longer show and it kind of all sort of snowballs from there um alongside you know genuine interest and support but I do feel like there's recently well, I, I certainly feel like there's a gap within the storytelling world now that Young Storyteller has um, come to an end. The UK Young Storyteller, there's still one running in Wales here. Um, that there is there is a lack of mentorship and there's a lack of like formalised mentorship. And I know that the Federation for European Storytellers are sort of looking into this at the moment. And I did a course with them um, for what they still call Young Storytellers, people aged under 30. Um where, you know, this came up quite a lot. We were talking about this a lot, you know, um, that it really is dependent on different institutions and organisations within the storytelling world to set up mentoring that they think works. So I work for the Welsh Storytelling Festival Beyond the Border as well um, as an engagement coordinator. And we've recently set up our own programme of mentoring um, called New Voices, Tlaesha Now With, um, simply because we felt like there was a bit of a there wasn't enough kind of of a route from say winning young storyteller or getting placed in young storyteller to then actually working professionally as a storyteller and working and making a sustainable living from it that there's this kind of bridge there that wasn't being crossed um so yeah i'm not saying that the program that we've set up is is solving all the problems but i think it provides at least some kind of a framework for people who are looking to work professionally to make steps into doing it what were your first steps into storytelling? Not necessarily as a profession, but, you know, how did you get started with it? Um, well, like I said, I had, I got these, when, when I won Young Storyteller of the Year back in 2013, part of the prize was performance opportunities. Um, so I had performance opportunity at Whitby Folk Week. Um, and I think there were a few others as well. Um, as well as some training opportunities and as well as bizarrely but very usefully um, insurance to work as a year for a year so like an insurance um, 
because if, if you work freelance as a storyteller, as you probably know, you do need to have your own personal liability insurance for, you know, running workshops and things like that. So that was one of the things that was offered as part of the prize, which is really practical and really useful thing to have if you're starting to work professionally. Um, so I started to just get gigs. And I think really what happened was that they sort of snowballed as a sort of word of mouth thing. Um, and I started to hustle a bit. I started to ask people for gigs. Um, I started to sort of, when I moved from Birmingham back to Wales, I did some quite con quite concentrated hustling by sort of emailing everybody who was involved in the storytelling world in Wales, emailing all the museums, emailing all the theatres, introducing myself. And I think one of the big things was actually saying, I am a storyteller, sort of calling myself a storyteller instead of just being like, oh, you know, I tell some stories. It was actually claiming that title and saying, no, I'm a storyteller. I'm going to work in Welsh and English. I'm going to tell these stories, like starting to build a repertoire. The biggest thing, the biggest step for me was a part, it's a um, programme that was set up by the Arts Council of Wales, um, which is an amazing programme that has offered a huge amount of artists work over the past five years called the Lead Creative Schools Scheme, um, where basically um, the Arts Council of Wales and the Government of Wales banded together, realised that um, children in schools needed to be um, taught in a more creative way. There's a new curriculum coming in and thought that the best way of doing that was to kind of ease teachers and children into working in a more creative way by getting artists into schools and working with them on a really kind of extended basis. And the first year I moved back to Wales, um, I had I started working with about five different schools on kind of extended residencies where I was going in one day a week. And I had to tell stories. I had to learn a really quick repertoire really quickly, kind of build my repertoire, extend it massively because I was in with the same class every single week and I couldn't tell them the same story that I told them the week before. So I had to, you know, develop repertoire really quickly and I had to develop workshop skills really quickly. And it was basically a baptism of fire. Um, if I hadn't had done that, I wouldn't be as experienced as I am now. I wouldn't have the repertoire that I have now. Um, and I was really lucky because that program, a lot of storytellers who started kind of within the storytelling revival back in the 70s talk about the school's work as being like, the apprenticeship that you need as a storyteller because children are the best audiences they will tell you if they're not having a good time they'll look the di a different way they'll go to sleep they'll you know have a chat with their friend so you learn very quickly what skills work and what don't and also because you're in school so much you have to build a repertoire really quickly and you have to just get that repertoire out even if you're not necessarily that confident with it um and that's basically what happened i was in school so much like every single day for six months doing this amazing work for the Arts Council. And I had to learn stories and I had to tell them and I had to figure out what kids wanted and, and it really extended my repertoire massively. Um, so I would say that was the kind of the first step into sort of professionally being like, yep, this is viable, I can do this. And I have the repertoire and I have the skills and I have the experience now to actually, when I approach people say, you can book me. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Excellent. Mm. For listeners who uh, perhaps don't know a lot about the storytelling community, um, do you feel like part of a community? What what is what is it like to be a storyteller in the UK, and mm. how does that how does that manifest? You know, where do you, how do you recognize yeah. of a storytellers? <laughs> <laughs> Are they wearing a swishy skirt? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I really do. It's interesting because I think there is a bit of a split between like the Welsh storytelling community and the UK storytelling community. And, and split's not the right word. I suppose I just see it as a bit of a distinction. Um that the storytelling community in Wales has a specific flavour to it. The storytelling community in the UK broadly has a has a different flavour to it. Um, but I don't think that they are vastly different. Um, I certainly feel, and I have felt particularly since the beginning of COVID, actually, that this that I have felt part of a storytelling community that is broader than just the UK. Um, it has felt more kind of a world storytelling community and by that I mean you know 
I guess, groups of people coming together on social media and sharing stories and sharing opportunities to perform. And particularly at the moment, with so much, so many things happening online, like workshops and discussion groups and performances, people starting to join and go to events that they would never normally get the chance to go to because, you know, they live in Canada and the events happening in Wales. Um, but actually that there feels like there's this there's this kind of network that's reaching out across the world of people who love stories, people who tell stories, people who work with story um, and people who call themselves storytellers. Um, and yeah, I think that um, the definition of the storytelling community is really broad and really vague and it changes depending on the circumstance. And sometimes it's people that you're in a workshop with for three days. Sometimes it's people who you work with you've collaborated with in the past sometimes it's people you've performed on a stage with you've shared a stage with them um sometimes it's people that you just know of by osmosis from other storytellers like you you mentioned amy douglas and um i actually did have never no i have met amy once in person but i've got to know her really well during the pandemic because she comes to my discussion group and we chat on the phone about things and I feel like she's become like a pandemic friend and obviously she will she will be a friend after the pandemic as well but I didn't really know her that well before then um and I suppose you know it, it's kind of it's quite a, a vast sort of group of people who are both working professionally and not professionally I suppose that's where it's quite vague who is part of the storytelling community because it's people who run clubs it's people who tell in their local clubs it's people who work full-time professionally as storytellers it's people who work in libraries and tell stories sometimes or work in schools and tell stories sometimes it's people who are stepping into storytelling from other art forms but I really like that it's quite um broad and I like that it's not a you know a closed church that it can kind of expand and encompass lots of different people and I really do think that while I know social media has huge downsides the advent of social media in linking people across the world who have interest in storytelling is, has been so, it's been amazing. It's made me realize just how many of us there are who call ourselves storytellers. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, I think I'm aware of a lot more storytellers and storytellers names since the pandemic Mm -hmm. began. And, you know, the Mm -hmm. more storytellers posting videos and, events yeah um and just huge zoom meetings or lots of different kind of zoom meetings and people are logging in from from all over the place from india Um, from yeah it's amazing i love it and i think the other thing like you mentioned social media and uh and you know um folk music um you know i'm I'm not Mm. a big twitter person but when my when the podcast is on twitter you know uh folklore thursday mm. and mythology monday and all these kind of things people just sharing in the smallest kind of tweet form all these little bits of folklore yeah um from all over the world yeah um yeah you're absolutely right and i think it's a hugely supportive community online as well because if i tweet something you know if i'm sharing an event or if i'm sharing I've got um, a performance podcast of my own. If I share one of the episodes of that, it will immediately be retweeted exactly like you say by, you know, Folklore Thursday and things like that. And just lots of different storytellers who I've never met in person, but I have connected with online. And, um, you know, we'll just, we'll be like, this looks great and share it with their followers. And I think that's, that's lovely. There's this real sense of community from that. I didn't actually know that you, you had a podcast now. That's, that's cool. What's it called? Uh, so it's a it's an interesting project. Um, I was funded by the Arts Council of Wales to do it um, during the pandemic, and it's called Pathways Shoibrai. And basically, the premise of it is that I craft um, routes around Cardiff, where I live, and I curate a set of stories to be listened to while people are walking those routes. Um, so it's kind of a walking through story experience, basically coming from having done a lot of story walks, not being able to do story walks anymore because they involve collecting people together and telling stories to them, um, which we can't do at the moment. Um, trying to do that in a different way. Um, but I also do encourage people who don't live in Cardiff to have a go at listening because um, I've, I've had a lot of people listen in places like California and Indiana and tell me that even though 
the performance is talking about landmarks in Cardiff and talking about Welsh mythology. They kind of loved the experience of walking through it anyway. Mm. Yeah. It's like a like a, a visualization meditation. Yeah. No, it does feel quite meditative. When I'm creating it, it feels quite meditative as well because it's not a guided tour by any means, but it's kind of meditating on landscape. It came from the idea where, you know, every day I would do my hours exercise like, you know, we were allowed to do by the government and I would go out for a walk and I'd listen to a podcast as I walked. And I thought there's something about walking and listening at the same time that feels quite powerful because you're kind of engaging with the landscape in a different way. You're you're listening to a story, but you're also, I certainly become very hyper aware of other things around me when I'm listening, you know, the smells and the sounds. And I was walking down by a river and the mud under my feet. And I was thinking, how do I bring those two things together? Mm-hmm. I might try that. That sounds really good. Give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll uh, we'll post links and stuff to all that so listeners Bad. can check it out. And uh, mm. something that I haven't done yet and probably should, you know, for listeners um, is uh, is post links to you know all the Facebook groups and things where you can find uh, where you yeah. can see all of these events and and all of the people from all over the world kind of getting getting involved. Um, yeah that's a great idea what were the first stories that you ever sort of stood up and told you mentioned the ones that you heard when you Mm. were a child were they the same story yeah I mean the first story that I ever learned to tell was the story that I won young storyteller of the year with um I didn't have any other stories when I competed I just had one story which was um the story of Llinevan Vach which is the story of the lady of the lake um a woman who comes out of the lake and meets a farmer and marries the farmer. Um, But then because she's from the other world, there's a set of conditions upon her remaining in our world. And he, he breaks those conditions and she returns to the world beneath the lake. Um, And it's a beautiful story. And it's very kind of very sort of classic Welsh, Welsh mythology because it involves this world and the other world. So that was the first story that I told And then I started to delve straight into Welsh mythology. And I know that some storytellers don't touch mythology with a barge pole to start with because it's so epic and it's so big. And they're like, no, no, we'll just I'll come to that later when I'm more experienced. But they were the stories that I remember being told. So I literally started to tell stories from the Mabinogi, like Blodeiwedd, the woman made of flowers, um, Branwen, which is the second branch of the Mabinogi. Um, which is a story about a Welsh princess taken to Ireland and a war that's created as a result. Um, and I basically just started to work with with all of that really kind of huge, hulking, um, dark, exciting, mystical Welsh mythology that felt really, um, it just felt like home to me to tell those stories. And I find it so funny when I talk to other storytellers about mythology, because like my friend Polly um, Tisdall is a, storyteller who doesn't feel like mythology is for her and she is always you know she'd always be like oh no no um I don't really feel that drawn to mythology it doesn't speak to me and mythology is just where I sit as a storyteller and it's what works for me um so yeah that was the stuff I first started to tell and then I started to build a a, a repertoire around the school's work so if schools wanted me to work with specific themes like environmental stuff comes up quite a lot at the moment with school's work I realized I needed a repertoire of stories that spoke to that kind of work. So I started to research and started to, you know, read collections of stories and dig a bit deeper into Welsh mythology and folklore and other folklores and find stuff that worked for various different workshops that I was running. So my repertoire now basically is extended to a lot of Welsh and Celtic mythology, but then also um, random stories that either I've heard other people tell and I've really liked and I've asked them if I can tell them or um, stories that I've had to develop for some kind of project that are along a certain theme that link with whatever that project was aiming to do. So it sounds like your, you know, your repertoire has been built through stories that you have an affinity for, that you have a, a mm. passionate interest in, and then there's also a pragmatic aspect to it. Yeah, I think so. How has your relationship with your kind of repertoire developed? Um, what are the kind of the main themes that you like to engage with? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I think early on, um, it was very much a kind of um, 
like you said, a pragmatic approach to, oh God, I have a gig. I need to learn a new story for, you know, when I was very, very early on and I only had a few stories in my repertoire. And now it's much more about telling stories um, that I think say something important for contemporary society. And I work a lot with, like I said, Welsh mythology, but the Welsh mythology is... um, (laughs) It's really problematic for um, particularly any issues of gender, particularly issues of representation of women. Um, And I struggle with it a lot. And I find now that I'm drawn to still telling those stories, but telling them in a way that has wrangled with particularly the female and the feminine within those stories um, and has found a way of repositioning it because there's just so much gender-based violence, so much... um, you know, really dark, really difficult subjects within that mythology to tell. Um, And as a young woman, I feel like I can't just tell it, I need to engage with that as a kind of political idea, as a social idea from a a personal perspective. Um, So I think that's how I'm still telling the same stories, but I'm telling them differently. and I feel like particularly um, with the example of the story of Blodé where the woman made of flowers, which is a, a story that um, I started to tell very early on. Every time I return to that story now, it's a different way of telling it. I have a different perspective on it. I have a different kind of approach to how I'm feeling about her as a central character, how I'm feeling about the male characters that circle around her, that basically create her, that give her to a man so that she can be married. Um, and how I feel about what has been set up as her subsequent betrayal of the man she's married, but to me seems like a kind of a bid for freedom more than anything. Um, and I, I think it's literally about as I grow up as a woman, as I become more mature as a woman, different parts of stories speak to me in different ways. You know, stories that spoke about women having children felt very, um, very separate from me when I started to tell them seven years ago but now as I reach my 30th birthday and as I start to think about whether I want to start a family they feel very different stories that talk about women who can't have children there's so many stories that talk about women that can't have children um, and you know go to witches to ask for help that kind of thing Um, those stories feel so different now when I'm telling them as a woman who you know is starting to think about do I want to have children can I have children I don't know you know all of those things they those issues within stories, particularly issues that face women within stories, they just feel different to me. And I'm sure that if I do end up having children, the stories that speak about relationships between mothers and children will feel really different to me. Whereas now I can tell them with a sense of separation and I can, you know, tell the the, the stepmother or the cruel mother stories um, with a kind of a relish and a glee. I'm sure that if I had my own children, they would feel really different. So I literally think that the way that the repertoire has changed for me, I have, I do make conscious decisions about which stories I choose to tell and which ones I'm interested in telling. And I like to tell stories that are challenging, that are, that have women in, in positions that are either very powerful or actually quite submissive. And how do I tell those stories in ways that reposition the women within those stories? But also I'm still telling the same stories. I'm just telling them and I'm different. So they're different. So your relationship with the stories change. Mm. here's a question do you feel like the way that you relate to your listeners or your audience changes as well it's a really interesting question (laughs) it's I think it comes down to why have you chosen to tell this particular story a lot of the time um and I will sometimes stand up and tell a story and I'm gonna I'll know that there'll be people in the audience that will find that story uncomfortable for whatever reason Um, it's combative, it's challenging, it repositions a female character in in a way that feels unexpected. Um, One one example is a story that I've added to my repertoire relatively recently, which is um, an adaptation of The Wife of Bath's Tale from the Canterbury Tales, um, which begins with um, a rape, begins with a man raping a woman. And then that man, he's a knight, he's sent off on an impossible quest to recompense for this rape and this violence and um he has to discover the answer to the question what is it that women truly desire and he knows this is impossible he's not going to be able to get this answer but he has to go anyway 
and he comes upon this hag in the forest. This is a very kind of truncated version of my version. He comes up upon this hag in the forest and she's like, yeah, I'll tell you the answer, but you have to make me your wife. Um, and basically the story culminates with, well, my version of the story, story culminates with her raping him. And it's really uncomfortable. Um, but, you know, I, I feel like it's necessary to get to that point within the story. Um, and I know that when I tell it, it sometimes feels like a vindication. It sometimes feels really uncomfortable and really challenging and really difficult for the audience to listen to. Um, but I think basically my relationship with the audience has gone from... I, I used to, when I, was early, when I was in my early days of telling want to create a world for them to step into and become lost in. And I still think there's a there's place for that. And I still do that sometimes. But I also think that there's a role for storytelling now to say, look at the world around you. And yes, okay, this story is taking place in a mystical realm. And yes, okay, you know, there's knights and hags and witches and fairies. But what is the story also saying for the society that we are in right now? particularly with stories of the environment. Actually, I've been doing a lot of environmental storytelling. It's something that sits with me really strongly. And when I tell those stories, I am expecting the audience to go away and change something, to do something in, different in their lives. You know, whether it's that they leave and they're like, okay, I'm going to switch to an energy efficient provider. I don't know, whatever it is. Um, that they actually feel called to action. Um and like I said, it's not every story, it's not every performance opportunity, but there are definitely times when I get up on stage now and I'm angry at the world and I'm angry at the people in charge of the world. And I'm like, let's sort this out. Let's do something about it. And if I can, as a storyteller, have some impact upon some of the people in the audience to just look and reflect on where we are in the world, um, then I think I've done a good job. That sense of mission and purpose is that Which, something you know I don't know if everyone has it might just be me <laughs> well, I mean, that's my next question uh is that something that you see elsewhere in the storytelling community is it something that storytellers can do together or do you think that we need more mm. of it um I think there is I mean the danger with the storytelling community I think and I say this with a huge amount of love is that we can become an echo chamber um, in that it is a small community. Um, we are often performing our shows for people who have been listening to stories for a long time and, and absolutely love storytelling and, and are often, you know, huge advocates of the causes that we are trying to talk about. And I suppose my my one concern is that I, I don't know how we get storytelling out of the sphere that it's in and to people who actually do need to also hear it. Um, I definitely think that, that the storytellers that I work with, um, that I see regularly, that I collaborate with regularly, have this huge hunger as well to make the world a better place. Um, I'm going to give you two examples of, of where I see this. So um, there's a lot of storytellers in Cardiff where I live um, who were involved in the Extinction Rebellion protests. Um, in Cardiff when the XR protests were here and you know we're, we're telling stories literally as part of the protests um so we've we've been telling stories of the environment to protest lack of action on the environment um and then I've also as part of my role at Beyond the Border I've set up um Friday morning discussion groups called Caskley which means collect and these happen on Zoom and storytellers from all around the world actually join it's become a really lovely community and we talk about um, these issues that I see as being quite key to storytelling. We'll talk about um, things like environment and storytelling. We'll talk about cultural appropriation within storytelling. We'll talk about gender in storytelling. And the discussions are very political and people do feel really called. And I'm not saying, you know, that's, that's the generalization. Not everybody feels that way. Not everyone sees a storyteller's role as um a didactic one or one that should be changing and one that should be um mobilizing but i do also feel like there's a an upswell of people who do believe that um and do see their role as artists as political i mean i i know that this is a massive conversation to have about art in general but i 
I don't see the point of doing what I do unless it does enact change. And I'm, I think there's a lot of people who do believe that and maybe believe it along different issues, but um, definitely I think that, that within the storytelling community, there are there's a community of people who are driving forward change in their own way. Mm. I mean, in some ways it's not surprising to me because, you know, the, the storytelling revival uh, you know, yeah. in the 70s, you know, had a lot of links to, um, you know, the folk revival. And yeah. obviously that exactly. has deep yeah. roots in, in protest and socialism yeah. and, and all of that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, no, exactly. And those were the, those were the musicians that I was watching when I was growing up. My parents are both like, you know, they were seventies folkies and they would take me to um folk music um festivals where I would hear people singing about, you know, um Tom Paine and his campaign for the rights of man and um, you know, um the like the the mine owners and things like that the cruelty of, of the mine owners the cruelty of capitalism the need to unionize but that's sung about in a folk song um so I, I i think you're right i think the links between storytelling and the folk revival and particularly the kind of um i suppose the people that run local story clubs that are basically like the backbone of the storytelling community in the uk they are often people who are also running folk music clubs and also tell stories and play music and they don't do it professionally they don't get paid for it but they are 100 percent the people that support like the growth of storytellers like me who are now working professionally you know you talked about gender mm. and working with problematic uh depictions of women and femininity mm. this is something that uh, i feel a lot as well when I'm dealing with stories. Um, mm. How do you feel about the way that men engage with those questions in their storytelling? Do you think they need to do more work? Uh, do you think they are doing good yeah. work? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do, basically. It's a short answer is yes. The long answer is um, I think some story, some male storytellers do a really good job of it, and I think other male storytellers don't. Um, I mean, I think on a really basic level, it's about stepping away from kind of tired stereotypes when you're describing women. Um, like, please, let's not call women as beautiful as the sun or things like that. Or, you know, even if you're going if you're going to call a woman beautiful, what is it about her that is beautiful without kind of being super generic about it? Um, or is it that the character that you're speaking from the perspective of that they think that she is beautiful, that they are drawn to her, that she is just not this kind of, this stereotype of a beautiful woman. All the other stereotypes that we have in stories like the hag and um, the old crone and the virgin and you know, all of those stereotypes that um, are just so 2D and are not developed. Um, I think beyond that, it's really about it, it's it's about challenging yourself as a storyteller. And, and I am not perfect at this either because I come from a quite privileged background. I'm middle class. I'm white. There are certain um, stories that I I feel very challenged to tell if they have characters of color in, um, and often I shy away from that material. Um, but it is really about sitting with the material and saying, what is this, what has this character experienced that I have not experienced that I need to give a voice to? Um, and things like violence against women or um, women who, women who have been placed in voiceless positions within stories where they are just kind of being um, they have no act, they have no um, active ability to change what is happening to them, like the, the very tired stereotype of a princess being rescued by a prince. Um, if you are going to tell those stories, sit with the princess for a bit as well. Sit with her experience for a while, because you know you may not have experienced that, and it's not. It, it's not a slight on you to say that you haven't experienced it. It's just who you were born and the skin you were born into and the body you were born into. But listen 
to that experience and tell it with with sensitivity i think um if you're going to tell sexual violence in a story tell it with an understanding of the embodied experience of that um if you're going to tell birth in a story tell it with an experience of the you know try and put something into it that isn't really kind of cliched and stereotyped um if you're going to think about whether you actually should be telling that story i think this is another question that i have for storytellers about things like cultural appropriation and stereotypes and stories if the story is just the story these stories were written down a very long time ago a lot of them um when the oral tradition was broken and they were written down at a time when, let's be honest, white men were in power. And so they were written down by white men. Um, and that's why there are problematic stereotypes within the way they've been written. It doesn't mean that those stories actually would have contained those stereotypes when they were first told, but it just means that when they were written down, they were written down at a certain political and social time. So have a look at that story. And instead of saying to me, oh, you know, <laughs> this was written down so I have to tell it in this way think about how you might be able to adapt it or even if you get to a point and you think this story it just doesn't work anymore for this society it doesn't work for the kind of person I want to be in the kind of society I want to tell to maybe don't tell it I really think one of the most powerful things we can do as storytellers is to say actually I'm not going to tell this story it's too hard it's too difficult it's not a nice story it's not doing anything for me and it's not doing anything for the audience I'm not going to tell it anymore mm -hmm. And I think that's fine to do. I don't know that I, I think that's a powerful decision. It's a respectable decision to make. Um, so yeah, I think that would be the thing I would ask people to look at. You know, it's it's really hard as a young woman going to storytelling gigs and hearing male storytellers tell stories about great heroes like Odysseus, you know, pillaging and raping his way around and you know engaging in in sexual encounters with faceless beautiful women it's just boring <laughs> I don't want to hear it anymore so can we just try and be a bit more interesting than that <laughs> I don't know do you think I'm being too too harsh <laughs> or do you think that's no I I mean I I feel like I've got a fairly strong antenna for some of this stuff. I'm not saying that mm. I that I have the same perspective or I know all of it, but I I I wince and cringe a lot. Yeah. Um I often use this as an example, like when some tropes are so tired, this isn't this is a story from T V, not not storytelling, but um, mm. do you did you ever watch the the most recent Free Musketeers show? Um <laughs> I didn't, but I think I know what you're going to say about this. Well, the first, the first episode was because um, it was so lazy. It was like they set out to to hit every single bad female character trope that they could possibly could. Yeah, they had the sexy male lead who pulls the female love interest into a kiss in order to to avoid yeah. pursuers or something like that. They had the evil woman who was also obviously a sexual deviant um the the cardinal he um he just he basically rounds on her at one point and he's basically like oh you know you get off on all this don't you you love it and all this kind of thing um before going out into the forest and shooting uh, another female character who's his concubine or something like oh that oh my god um and then and then the same character who got pulled into the kiss um uh gets gets the musketeers into the camp by um pretending to be a prostitute and being really embarrassed by having to do it it's like every single one yeah. of the tired tropes every yeah, single one of them in the first episode them. um <laughs> now and and i just i just remember yeah. thinking there sitting like think sitting there thinking like have the people who've written this show like missed the last you know 10 or 20 years <laughs> yeah 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 where were you and, and um, why and yeah. why don't you care you know why why mm. why are you so on kind of like alienating half of your audience and not caring about the fact that if it makes me wince i was thinking how does it making women feel um i think the musketeers show did get better in some aspects regards to that but i remember that first episode 
just being like, oh my gosh. <laughs> no, definitely. I think that's a really good litmus test, actually. Like, look at the stories you're telling. And in those stories, are the women dead, naked? Are they a prostitute? Are they this, are they crone of some description? You know, um, and if they, if those are all the stereotypes that you're hitting in all of the stories you're telling, you need to find some new stories to tell. Or you need to go back to the stories you're telling and think, maybe I should tell the stories from the perspective of the women instead of the men. And I think you'll find it quite transformative. I don't know about you, but I I found one of the ways of working with problematic material when it comes to gender is literally to gender sw- switch things and to say, maybe not gender flip the characters, but to say, this story was written down from a male perspective. I'm just going to try and tell it from the perspective of the women. And sometimes that's really hard work because the women are not involved in that much of the story. But there are other times when the women are actually, you find that they're actually incredibly central to the story. They're just not being given the page time, you know. (laughs) So there's a way of doing it. It's just about taking the material and and squishing it and remaking it and saying, what can it be now? What is it? Why are we doing this now? Why are we telling the story now? What is the point of retelling something that has been written down and retold many, many times, if not to do it in a new way? Yes, um, I'd be really interested to hear your opinion on a lot, a lot of the episodes that we've been doing in our last series because we're working with mm. Greek mythology, um, and I've been both um, presented with this challenge and quite excited by it in some ways, although also cautious mm. as a male storyteller, yeah. um, and also really surprised by some of the amazing things that you find out within or about the existing material. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a couple of examples. Um, it did the story of Pandora. Mm-hmm. I made uh, a decision to borrow a trope from another um, area of Greek mythology to kind of change the story a bit because the way mm-hmm. that certainly I've been told or read the Pandora story is like she's the equivalent of Eve she's the first woman yeah. who brings evil into the world by <laughs> by being silly and and, and all this yeah. kind of stuff um and um for me it was important that you know she she doesn't become she isn't the pattern for womankind so I actually decided mm. to make her the same thing that Euripides said that Helen was not a real woman, but actually um, a trick that the gods have made, uh, something mm. called a an eidolon, a phantom. Um, mm. And then it ends up being more about uh, Prometheus's br- brother Epithemius and what he and 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 his kind of failings that mm. that are more important in that story. But what was amazing mm. is I actually uh, read a book by um, a scholar called uh, Adrian Mayer and discovered that. The way in which the story is told um, is definitely a decision that men have been making for a long time. Because in actual yeah. fact, the um, a lot of the original myths that talk about Pandora specifically talk about her as being like a woman, a representation of a woman, mm. and talk about how Hephaestus makes her on his forge. And it's like, wait a second. It's, quite a lot mm. of indications here that she wasn't a real woman at all <laughs> let alone like the first woman um that's amazing and there's even some stuff that i've read as well about the idea that uh, because the the person who um the most famous telling of pandora is from uh hesiod uh who is a raging misogynist because he tells a story mm. and then he literally goes on to say and this is um this is like the evil that women bring on the world. World, they're parasites who eat up all the food that men make, and all this kind of thing, mm-hmm. and um, and they're the cause of all our pain because um, they're horrible, but we need them, and all this kind of awful stuff. Um, <laughs> but apparently, a lot of scholars have like kind of looked into it and like taken it apart and kind mm-hmm. of said, well, what seems to be happening here is that he uh, he is probably telling a myth that he has from somebody else which wasn't mm. so horrible and de- and denigrative about women and that Pandora might even have been 
a female equivalent of Prometheus at one point, you know, mm. because Pandora means mm. gift or gift gift giver or gift yeah. bringer. So mm. it's Hesiod who's perverted, who's possibly perverted the meaning of that and turned it into a misogynist fable. And you're like, well, yeah. so, you know, Hesiod was making decisions about these things. So yeah. that's why we make decisions about and change the way that we present them and, and that as Absolutely. well. So it's an instructive yeah. kind of like thing against people who say, oh, you can't change the myth or whatever. It's like, no, yeah, you, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. You can, you, you should. Know, we have to be aware <laughs> that the people who wrote these stories down had their own agenda. And if we came from an unbroken oral tradition, which most of us don't in the kind of Western, certainly storytelling tradition, um, we would we would know that there was this adaptation happening from teller to teller and we would be more aware of that as a thing and we'd be more open to it as a thing. But I think because we, we, are, we are just in the nature of the way that storytelling works for so most of us here in the UK, and I'm obviously discounting people like Shona Lee from that, um, but for most of us who come from a storytelling tradition that was broken, the oral tradition was broken and it was written down, we do seem to have this tendency, despite that, to be like, well, the book says this, and so I'm going to have to tell it like this. Um, but they were written down at a time when the world was very different to the way it is today. So we absolutely have the right to take those stories and say, let's make something new out of them. And that doesn't mean being you're being disrespectful to the source material. It's just literally respecting the tradition that where that source material comes from, which is orality, adaptation, people, as you say, exactly with their own agendas, writing something down and then being like, ha ha, they'll never notice I've changed the story, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that's such a, that's such a lovely way of, of approaching it, really. And what you just said about, you know, both adaptation and borrowing, I think borrowing is a really key tool with this. Like, um, there's a lot of stories I've approached that I think to myself, I'm not sure I can tell this story in the form that it exists currently. And I'm not sure I can adapt this form enough to make it work. And I'm returning to the wife of Bath's tale actually for this as well, um, because that story I struggled with telling just at, in the form that it exists within the Chaucer. Um, so I've kind of borrowed from a folk song um, that I first heard sung by Steel I Span called King Henry, which is about King Henry, um, going off um, on a hunting trip and coming upon this house in the middle of nowhere. And then a giantess turns up and is like, feed me, give me wine, spend the night with me. Um, and it's amazing. And she's just this kind of really hideous, but also incredible character who then in the morning turns into a, a woman, a, a young woman and a young, um, beautiful woman. I'm using that word at that. Um, but I sort of mash the two together really because they, they felt like the same story. They felt like they came from the same tradition and it made me able to tell the Chaucer putting in this kind of more sort of uh, this, this hag character that eats and eats and eats and grows and grows and grows and becomes this kind of terrifying monster that the knight eventually has to face. Um, and I, I don't know, I think borrowing is a really powerful tool with that because like, you know, these stories exist across so many different traditions as well. And the forms of the stories, um, are really transportable and have, you know, traveled for hundreds of thousands of miles. So it might be that there's just something in a different version of the story that you can kind of, you can just take and you can tweak and you can put into your own version and make, that makes that version able to tell. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's a technique that I use a lot and I think it's quite important for when I'm being creative uh, with a story you know, you, you know, you're asking these questions about restructuring it and things, but um, you want it to remain true to the storytelling tradition. And a lot of those mm. uh, kind of structures and rhythms, you know, they, they're connected to all sorts of things like how we listen and how they, I think, how they land in our brain and keep our attention and all yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and so... Um, one of the things that I I tend to think stories become less successful sometimes when I'm listening to something that's been changed a bit when it's becoming more literary you know you can almost hear it mm -hmm. become, like slipping away from the tropes of oral storytelling 
and into uh, I don't know st- stream of consciousness narration and stuff. And as yeah. you said before, you know storytelling is a broad school, and there are some people who who actually get up now and do do storytelling performances that are a lot more like that, and they can yeah. be good and they can be fine. But it's not my bag. Um, and yeah. uh, um, yes. Anyway, just an observation. <laughs> no, I think that's really interesting because I you're you're right, and I think um, we can get caught up into conversations about what is storytelling and where do we draw the line in terms of what we think of as being traditional storytelling and I'm putting that in quotation marks um and what we think of as being other types of storytelling and you know I right at the beginning of working as a storyteller I um was lucky enough through my university to get an internship at the Moth um storytelling organization in New York and in the US, of course, the storytelling tradition is very different. It's all kind of autobiographical storytelling. The storytelling, you know, broadly as a generalization tends to happen in the first person, tends to be, um, a lot of it seems to happen in present tense as well. Um, so it'll be like, I'm running down the street and I see, you know, whatever, go on with the story. And that seemed to me so, so alien because I came from this tradition of third person, past tense, that's what works, everyone does that, and we follow certain tropes. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm with you. It is, it is really interesting when people get up and do something slightly different, and it's interesting how jarring it is to your brain as well when you've been wired in a certain way. Um, I, whenever I run storytelling workshops, I do actually encourage people to try out different tenses and different, whether they tell first person, third person to just give it a go and see where it lands and what, whether there's moments where they can make that choice. And there's times now when I'm telling where I will actually go into a slightly more poetic spoken wordy style, um, where I will maybe go into present tense really quickly for a short moment say if there's something really violent happening or there's something really traumatic happening I might tell that in the present tense and then go back into past tense and just mess around with it and see how it feels sometimes I do voice characters in the first person for a moment and people do find it jarring but I quite like that they find it jarring because I'm literally saying I'm going to step into this character just for a moment um, I think this generally works for me in longer shows where there's that crafting, you can put that crafting time in and you can think more about exactly where you want to do those things. Um, but I think having that freedom to move between a more kind of formal style of storytelling, which definitely for me sits in third person past tense, and then maybe a more kind of informal style of storytelling that maybe does move between different tenses and different person is really fun. I think it's, I think it gives you, um, like a sort of a fun smorgasbord of things you can choose and things you can kind of um, play mm. with. Yeah, I'm actually I'm a big fan of the third person present. I use it quite a lot. And, Ooh, and for me, interesting. It, is, <laughs> um, it is very, just for really uh, key scenes, like you say, um, really mm-hmm. immediate and present scenes, um, violence um, or, you know, like a, a, a dramatic moment. Um, I often slip into that um, and I find it quite an effective thing for bringing it forward yeah. in, in somebody's mind. Um, and the other thing is our, our show at the moment is uh, plays with frame tales a bit and kind of that a, vid- a video yeah. narrative structure. And the first person can become um, important and effective if you have a character telling a story, sometimes it's about somebody else, so it's third person, but sometimes it is actually about themselves. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I think that's fascinating. Um, And I'd really like to see storytellers play with that more, Um, particularly kind of um, sort of the big stage, contemporary storytellers, um, platform storytellers, have a go at playing with that more, because I think what we are in danger of a little bit within the kind of UK storytelling scene. Um, And I'm saying this with a lot of love for the revivalist tellers, but also with a kind of sense of let's also see where we can go is that there's like now a sort of what I perceive as being like a house style of um, what we think of as being contemporary performance platform Mm. storytelling within the UK. 
Um, and it's, you know, it can be as much as like how you phrase things how you, um, whether you focus more on action in your story or emotion in your story. You know, I've been told by storytellers in the past that we should put limited emotion into story, that story should be action orientated, which has never sat with me because I, I feel so drawn to emotion in story. I find it very difficult to tell things without getting emotional myself. You know, I feel that the, story, the story's emotion often plays on me when I'm telling. Um, and I've been told in the past, you know, storytellers shouldn't be emotional when they're telling. They're literally just telling the story. They're a vehicle for the story. Um, and I just, I think that there's there's space for everything, essentially. I think there's space to feel the pain of a story, to feel the emotion of the story you're telling. I think there's space to play, like you say, with different tenses, with different how you're telling, with sometimes putting it into something that doesn't feel like traditional storytelling in inverted commas and just see how it goes and see what works on the audience and what works on you um because you know we need to see if we can step out of the places where storytelling has happened for the past 30 years and that's not to say that the storytelling shouldn't happen in those places and shouldn't continue to happen in those places but also there's audiences that we could get involved in storytelling if they were, if they saw something that challenged them a little bit, mm. I think, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting what you're saying about how styles though, because uh, even though yeah. I'm not, I, you know, I don't go to them a lot, but I, uh, you know, I, I, like I said, I imagine the moth has a, a house style. Um, oh, so much. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. A lot of spoken word poetry sounds very, very similar. Like, if you follow some like yeah. I follow button poetry on um on Facebook um and mm. uh, they have lots of like different performers and a lot of them are very good but so much of it the cadence and the rhythm with the voice and the way that they deliver it is is uh it's exactly the same and it would be so easy to uh, to adopt and or parody very quickly <laughs> Yeah, 100%. And it's it's because, you know, people see something that they like and they do what I do when I see something I like, which is magpie it and think, oh, I might just have a go at giving that a try myself. Or I might like, you know, um, just experiment with how I might adapt that into a story of my own. But I think there is a danger then of us looking at stuff that doesn't fit that mold and saying, well, that's not that's not what we expect storytelling to be. Um we're not going to, and particularly this comes down to like the power of people who program and people who platform storytellers. And, you know, we only have two, maybe three big storytelling festivals in the UK, I would say. Is that, do you think that's fair? We're looking at Beyond the Border, Fate, maybe Settle Stories within that as well. And then I'm pretty sure that there's a storytelling festival that happens at the Scottish Storytelling Centre as well. I'm probably definitely forgetting things, but I'm thinking about like big scale storytelling festivals now. Yeah, I mean, Fate, fate and Border would be the ones that come straight to mind. Beyond the Border and, and Fate, then, really, yeah. Uh, the the um, ones that you mentioned. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I know there's other smaller festivals as well, obviously, that happen um, around um, the UK and, and the rest of the British Isles. But, um, you know, who the people who get programmed for those festivals, we are seeing, we do see the same names getting programmed over and over again. And that's because they're, they're really great. They're brilliant storytellers, but they are overwhelmingly male. They're overwhelmingly white. And um, there needs to become a point where we allow people onto the big stages in those festivals that don't fit those, those two categories that are new voices that are maybe haven't done the big stages before, but we need to platform them anyway, because if we don't platform them, they're never going to reach that point. And then um, I really think there's a there's a jump to be made for people between like the smaller stages in festivals and the smaller stages in story clubs to the big stages, which is really hard for people to make without venues and programmers saying, we're going to take a chance on them. They don't fit what we have previously thought of as being platform storytelling because of their style, because of the stories that they tell but we're going to do it anyway. And we're going to challenge our audiences to sit there and listen to them. Um, 
because otherwise we do have the same names being being platformed all the time um and i would just call for for some risk taking i suppose mm. within that <laughs> is there a you know a, a low stage big stage is there a middle stage because i suppose i you know i don't go to festivals and stuff as as much as you do mm. i was a little bit surprised to hear you saying it's predominantly male because my perception was there was a lot of female storytellers and I think uh, somebody I was talking to recently said that one of the biggest things that he'd noticed changing was that he, it almost seemed like there was more female storytellers than male storytellers now. I think there is a certain level. I think there's a certain level of um, female storytellers, of, of storytellers in general, where there are more mm. female storytellers. And I would say that within kind of the pla- the, the um, story club circuit and maybe like the, the middle stages of the festival then I would say you're absolutely right. I still think that broadly on yeah. the kind of biggest stages, we're still looking at, there's still overwhelmingly men taking those spots. Um, the big names, yeah. Um, and I don't know, particularly if you ask people maybe to name storytellers in the UK, I mean, if they can do it, they're gonna give you the same four names probably. Um, and it's interesting because most of those names are men still. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean... The, the big names, I guess, if that's... Uh, yeah. I suppose everybody's... Yeah, I just... Because um, I was just thinking mine wouldn't all be men, but, you know, that, that might not be typical. So I'm thinking about someone who maybe isn't within the storytelling community or is, hasn't kind of tapped into storytelling. If somebody does know of a storyteller, they'll probably give you you know, um, you know, in Wales, they might say Daniel Morden. Um, and I say that with huge love for Daniel. Daniel's amazing. He's incredibly supportive of me. He's incredibly supportive of new voices. He's a wonderful person. Um, but I know that when I talk to people who don't know much about storytelling, they will know Daniel's name, but they won't know anyone else. Um, but yeah, no, I just think it's an interesting idea. I think you're absolutely right that there seems to be like a prevalence of women at a certain level but I'd be really interested to see what happens if they get put on the biggest stages and you know challenged to 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 have to perform to an audience that is bigger than the one they've known because it's it's really hard I think when you're kind of coming into storytelling to make those steps to kind of make the jump between different sides of audience different size of venue because you get very used very quickly to performing to say 30 to 50 people, then you have to go up to like 100 people, 150 people. But the biggest stages that beyond the border and fate will certainly be on the border are like between 800, it can be above 800, you know, there's a, that's a lot of people to have to perform to. Um, and it's a different style of performance. And if you haven't been kind of trained up to it, there's a reason why venues and programmers are like, oh, I'm not sure I would trust that person on that stage because they've never done it before. But it's like the, the age old question, if you don't have the experience, you can't do it, but you can't do it without the experience, you know? <laughs> Which I guess um, leads us back full circle to the whole thing about mentorship and programs and things, isn't it? Because yeah. you, those are systems in which you can bring people up and also give those stages and providers some confidence in. Uh, yes what's, what's definitely mm. yeah brilliant wow uh this has been an amazing conversation thank you uh it's really good to talk to you again yeah you too thank you so much i really enjoyed it you've been listening to a guest episode of law and legend with storyteller tamar williams you can find out more about Tamar's storytelling on her website at www.tamarellunedwilliams.com. The link for that and to her Pathways Storytelling podcast is in the episode notes. The law and legend theme music in this episode was performed by Robert Bentor, with additional music from the Sekilo Museum of Ancient Instruments. To find out more about episodes of Lore and Legend, you can visit us at www.loreandlegend.co.uk and check out our episode blog posts. 
If you like what you hear and you'd like to hear more, then please consider joining our family of patrons and supporting the podcast. For more details, visit our website and click support us to find out everything that you need. Thanks again for listening, Story Folk. We'll be back soon with another guest episode of Law and Legend. Thank you.